I guess you might be looking at uh, what to expect when working with the brand. So brands are all very different. Some have a very, very clear brief. Others have no idea at all what they're doing. To be proactive and to facilitate this process is really useful for you to do and to consider how they're looking at you and how they want to work with you. Some brands will call you every single day to check in on a project. Some will have like seven or eight different processes to go through the PR and the brand team and the marketing team. Other brands won't talk to you at all and like, yep, cool, done, excellent, uploaded it, send me the link, and you're fine. So you need to be prepared for all these different eventualities and, and be proactive again in that process. So brands often think that they know nothing really, 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 really well, and they'll try and tell you what to do and how to do it and when to do it, but the reality is no one will know your audience as well as you do. Um, so it's really important to impress that upon them, and it's really important to be involved in this process. So you don't want to create something that's not going to work for your audience. If it's, if it's not going to work for your audience, you know they're not going to like it, then we'd advise you not to do it just for the money, because you will definitely impact the growth of your channel, because you won't be seen as authentic. Okay, so this is a really interesting little example. Justice Crew meets Royal Stampede and Brittany Lee Saunders. Has anyone ever, ever, has anyone ever heard of uh, Royal Stampede or Brittany Lee Saunders? Some hands in the air. Good. Okay, awesome. Um, so, Sony approached us to do a project to help release a song called I Love My Life um, by uh, these guys. Um, by, by the Justice Crew. And it was really interesting because Sony was like, okay, the audience really wants to see them singing. And we're like, you sure they want to see them singing? Like, yeah, 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 that's what they want. So we did some analysis, we, you know, we checked in with their audience, we looked at the data, we realized they don't actually want to see them singing. They want to see them dancing, doing pranks, and hanging out with chicks. And so <laughs> basically we identified um, some really good pranksters, being the Royal Stampede guys, and a really funny uh, and awesome uh, lady, Brittany Lee Saunders, who's a, a beauty girl and also a comedian. And so we actually integrated them into the video clip itself. But it was quite a funny process because um, basically we snuck onto the set. It was, a, it was an all day shoot, single day shoot out in Parramatta and Sydney. And we snuck the Royal Stampede guys into the set and basically pretended that they were behind the scenes crew. And they pretended to be basically an obsessed fan. And so constantly stalking the guys the whole time. And we created a really cool piece of content around that. And then Brittany Lee Saunders also pranked them by doing the, their makeup for the shoot. But they actually put the lipstick and other stuff on them and they didn't realize. And so they came out on set, they looked really silly. Uh, long story short, we actually ended up having a fight with these guys on the set, but the other guys were in on it. It worked out really, really well. And they all became friends. And then they went and did a prank together in the streets where they got dressed up as an old grandpa and the best dancer <coughs> did this really awesome prank in the streets of Parramatta. And so in a single day, we captured all this content and we got over 10 million views across this content across all channels with no paid media at all. So that's really about understanding the audience and how they work and what they want. And so it also doubled their album sales. So it was very successful for them and also it increased the size of the, uh, of the Justice Crew channel, I think by it was like 400% or something, uh, increased for the same period previously. So they're pretty happy with that outcome. Oh yeah, do you, do you, want, to, do you want to watch one video? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Which one? Take two. The prank one. The prank one? I reckon the dancing prank one. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. We'll check that one. Hey, what's up with the Royal Stampede here with the Justice Crew? And uh, it's time for a little prank with Grandpa Brian. Hey, guys. Big favour. Can you please, please, please? I need to go in there and drop something off. I'll be 30 seconds. It's alright, I just leave my grandpa just for two or one minute. Yeah, it's yeah, alright. One minute, so no problem. Thank you. No, I'll be back in two minutes. No, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No, but we'll put him in here. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> it's better, isn't it? Beautiful day, isn't it? Good day, alright. Why don't you stand up?
So it's completely dependent on, on the industry, on the value of that industry, on the CPMs associated with how much they need to pay to target that audience, how niche your audience is. There's a lot of variability when it comes to that. So it's also a bit of a test and learn. Throw it out there, sometimes go low, other times if that seems easy, just throw a really high number and see how they respond, and then come back to the middle ground, or find someone who may know in the area and ask them. Um, again, so what are they hoping to get out of this experience? Um, you know, so they do they want you, uh, you know, to create multiple pieces of content? There's all different sorts of things. So I guess you know how they plan to uh, you know measure success. What are their KPIs for success? Do they want viewership? Do they want engagement? Do they want watch time? Do they want click throughs? Do they want to sell something? For some things like that. Remuneration, so what are you hoping to get out of this? How much do you want to be paid? Is there more than money involved? It's really important to define this up front to make sure when you're going to get paid. Are you going to get paid 50% up front, 50% at the end, when the campaign's finished, when they've sold the product? Uh, you need to define this on paper. We also hear stories of people who don't get paid. They do it over the phone. Like, yeah, yeah, sounds good, awesome, mate. Done the video. It's like, oh, what? You know, you want us to pay you? Well, no, we said we might pay you, but we didn't. So, <laughs> Uh, be very, very clear on this, have it written down. Good. Um, so workflow, how are you going to work together? What are the key dates and what are the lines of communication? Whether it is on WhatsApp or you know, email, whatever it is, make sure you are consistently communicating with that person. Just like the way you run a business, you need to be very clear and open in what you're doing and what you're delivering and how you're delivering it. You know, whether, you, whether your content needs to be reviewed before it goes up. We have situations where someone just uploads it before it's been reviewed. So it needs to be reviewed you know, and, and, and checked in by the brand possibly. Some brands have like five or six lines, as I mentioned before, of, of approval processes. And it can take two months to get something approved. Other brands, they can approve it on the spot. Depends on their size and, and what they're looking to do. Yeah, if you're working for a small business or something, you know, like the hairdressers down the road or something like that, they might not mind. You know, that you can just upload that and go ahead. If you're working with Telstra, or someone like Telstra, <laughs> you know, someone like Telstra. Um, it can take you, yeah, as Steve said, up to two months. So, yeah, you really need to know, or just be open and have that expectation really clear before you go into it. And it just, that's what they need to do. They have a large organisation with a lot of key stakeholders. So, it just simply, that's, that's an important part of the process for them to get those approvals. Yes. Are we open to brands overseas, like international? Should we be pushing that, or really just question. Australian? Sure, sure. So, you know, what brands care about is that you have an audience where they're serving their product. If you're got a, you know, you're an Australian creator and, and two percent of your audience is in Australia, as soon as they find that out, they're not going to want to work with you in this country. So, if you've got your know, audience in Taiwan or South Korea or somewhere else like that, approach the brands in that country because it doesn't matter where in the world you are. You are essentially international creators and international business people will all become very, very successful. Um, and so it's important to consider these things um, when you're creating content. Oh, that's okay, let's go forwards. Deliverables, so what exactly are you delivering to them and by when? We sort of have already covered this, but you really need to be very clear on this process. And it, it comes down to, like some of the projects we worked on, we did a project with Meat and Livestock, uh, which is actually, you know, basically managed the red meat industry in Australia, they're worth over $5 billion per annum, so it's a huge industry. We did a lot of really cool brand integration stuff with this. Um, but it came down to, um, yeah, even down to the, the likes and the comments and like, you know, very descriptive process to understand what you, what you need to deliver. Do you need to share something? Is it posted on their channel? Is it posted on your channel? Be very clear and don't go into this process until that is clear. They might say, oh, I actually can do another video for us. I'm like, sure. If you keep on over delivering too much, then I'll start to expect that from you moving forward and suddenly you, you, know, you get paid 10,000 bucks for one video and suddenly doing three videos for 10,000 bucks and <coughs> you'll build that expectation moving forward. So be professional and deliver what you said you're going to do. Yeah. And some brands have, haven't really had much experience working with influencers, so don't assume that they <coughs> know the process either. So that's why it's really important to kind of take note of, um, of these processes. So for example, if you're being um, asked to create a video and they're like, yeah, cool, just shoot the video. Um, I, I, we would always recommend creating like a treatment or a storyboard or something like that to show them before you start producing because there'd be nothing worse than producing a video than showing it to them and then being like, oh no, we don't want that. Like we want it something completely different. Um, so the more that you can kind of set their expectations at the beginning, the easier it'll be. Um, and also creating a report at the end of the project can be a really good thing to do um, to kind of just sell in, you know, this is what I did for you, this is why it was so good. Um, and they'll have that document as a, as, as a record of the great work that you've done and 
hopefully it'll yeah, provide uh, reason to engage you again. Okay, uh, keeping it real. So this, we've talked about what grants are for creators. This is what you guys should be expecting from grants. Um, in the same way, you want to be looking for a brand that is of interest to your audience. So you want to be thinking about, you know, I know who my audience is, I know what they like, and they would really like this product, or they would be really interested in this product, or they would really like a piece of content that could have a bit more funding, so I'm happy to work with this brand. Um, you might want production resources, so you might not be interested in the money, you just want to create the best piece of content ever, and you don't know how to fund it, so this brand might be able to provide that solution for you. Um, you want to make sure that you can maintain your relationship with your audience, we've said that a few times, about making sure that you're not jeopardising the audience experience just because you've got a brand in the way. Um, again, you want shared... Oh yes, hello. Can I ask a question on that? Um, do you tell your audience it's a branded content deal? Yes or no? Uh, well, actually, the Australian law doesn't require you to. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, there's a guideline. On, on YouTube, there's a guideline for anywhere, not Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there is a checkbox on YouTube, so I recommend that you click that checkbox. But in terms of actually telling your audience, um, yeah, there's no, there's no law. But they do say that they, the, the guideline says that they want you to um, clarify if it's a sponsored post or not. Sometimes it's really obvious, in which case I wouldn't really worry too much. Um, but if it's really subtle and integrated, you might just put in the description, um, you know, this video was brought to you by something, something, or I got help from blah, blah, to create this video. Yeah. Oh, we're going to hold up on questions. We've got 10 minutes to get through 15 slides. So, so we're taking our time. Questions. Okay. I'll just um, power through and then hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end or you can come over and ask them. Um, brand alignment, so that was the same point as before. Make sure you have the shared values as that, same, as that brand. Um, and money. Money's always good. Uh, so finding out what your audience is or what, um, for that pitch deck or for communicating with brands about who your audience is, of course you can go into your analytics, whether it's on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, find your analytics and look at the target audience and then geographic location to your point about you know, what country you want to be talking to. Um, read the comments to understand, to get a sense of what your audience is interested in. Um, so I screen grab these from uh, Wendy's channel. So, you know, a lot of her audience was like, oh my gosh, I love Pretty Little Lies, oh my god. Um, and they also say, oh my god, I love your hair, oh my god. <laughs> so knowing that they love her hair and they want to know how she has her hair is a good, good hint that working with a hair product would be a good thing for her to do. Um, and perhaps uh, doing a Pretty Little Liars review or something like that would also be something that her audience would be interested in. Uh, here's Rupert. This is Rupert, the fashion influencer. We made him up. Um, so, <laughs> here's a man, uh, oh no, his primary audience is men, 14 to 24, um, from America, Australia and Singapore. His values are style and fashion, looking at best, classic and style, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, looking at these different brands, which one would you say would be the best fit for him? Sunglasses. Sunglasses. Oh my gosh, you guys are paying attention. It's really good. Um, yeah, so obviously I agree Best movie is not really his target audience. And Pacific Cruise uh, <coughs> holidays might be a little bit older than who he's going for, so yeah, nail it. Here's an example of how not to do it. So this is a, a really successful Instagram and blogger, um, Chris Cassell Lim. You may have heard of her, she's from the States. Um, she basically does lifestyle, style, beauty, skincare on her blog and Instagram. She did this uh, integration with Volvo about being uh, really eco-conscious and sustainable and it just came out of the blue for her followers. They were like, this is, you've never talked about caring about this stuff before. Um, and it felt very like not her language as well. And straight away, she got a lot of anger from her fans being like, this is fake, I don't believe it. Your feed has just been you know, filled with all this garbage now and I'm not interested. Um, and you might go, oh, well, that's an inevitability of working with brands. But um, if you take a look at the next example, same influencer, um, it's very branded, um, and she's saying, you know, my latest, my latest obsession, um, but she's got, you know, discount codes and stuff for this product, but because it's skincare, it's what her fans are going to her for. They want advice on this stuff, um, so they don't mind actually being advertised this type of content as long as it aligns with her um, values. So straight away, they're like, oh my god, where can we buy it? Oh my gosh, tag, tag, tag my friends, you guys would love this, and it was just, it was really well received. <coughs> don't be afraid of working with brands. Um, basically, the main thing to think about is you've built an expectation with your audience, whether it's entertaining them, whether it's giving them information about how to do your gardening, 
or whatever it might be. Fulfill that expectation when they come to your channel. Fulfill that expectation when you're working with a brand. Um, the further that you remove them from that expectation, the more upset they're going to be um, and the more they're likely to turn away and not come back. So just, yeah, if they come to you for inspiration on living an organic lifestyle, obviously don't go and use uh, products with chemicals in it just because they're paying you to do it because it will impact your growth um, significantly. So, in conclusion, uh, what do brands <coughs> want? Um, so the nature of a brand deal is diverse as the creators are. There are so many different types of brand deals you can do, so don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, brands want to create with a targeted audience and shared values. Make sure that your audience and your values align. If they don't align, you shouldn't do it. It's like going out with someone who just knows you about it, so creating a pitch deck is a great way to help you get brand deals with other opportunities and, and get other opportunities. So they need to know who you are. It's like a little CV. It's fun. It's informative. It, it, it's personable. It makes you, you know, they want to talk to you. Think of it like a dating site. You know, they want to see you. Oh, they want to meet this person. It's going to be great and fun to work with this person. And they really hit who we're trying to target. Um, and also adapt to each person. Don't just use the same one for every single, uh, you know, every single brand you're going with. Adapt it to their needs. Use their colors. You know, stuff like that in, in, in your pitch deck. Um, so a pitch to a brand, consider how you can help them make their job easier. If they're trying to target someone and not doing a good job, help them and give them some information to how it could work better for you because you are also a potential customer for them. Um, managers can be a great way to get brand deals uh, that come to you. Just make sure that you do your research first. There are a lot of people out there who are shysters. Don't work with those people. Research them before. Don't get locked into a contract in perpetuity uh, where they take 99% of your uh, revenue. You'd be surprised how many people do things like that. Um, so make sure you research them. There's also some great <coughs> managers out there. So again, brand expectations will vary, but you can't go wrong by providing a professional experience. Be professional. You are business people. Uh, you are international business people. You will be very successful shortly if you follow all these little tips and tricks. Um, so they may know more about your product you know, than you, of course, but you probably know more about your audience than them. Really important. Again, you know your audience. Uh, you know what they're going to like and not like. Uh, managing expectations is very important. Don't wait until it's too late. Um, establish upfront the objectives, remuneration, workflow, and deliverables. And don't disrupt your audience's expectations uh, of what you are creating. You know, your values are, are really important. So just because you've got a brand deal doesn't mean you need to just, you know, do whatever uh, they want you to do. Um, decide up front what you would and would not be willing to do for a brand. That's it. That's it. Thank you. That's So I'm currently in the, the gaming industry, but I suppose this is like relevant for, uh, for like fashion industry and makeup industry as well. So um, if you've got like a small degree of success on your channel, it's usually very easy for brands to be willing to send you products to review and that sort of stuff. How do you move from being like someone that's receiving free product to someone who's able to receive um, payment or remuneration for your content? How do you move to that next level? And how do you sort of get uh, prevent yourself from being stuck in the trap of being a free sort of product sort of <coughs> Um, I guess it sort of comes back to uh, what well, the size of the audience is really important, you know, the value that you add to them. You know, if, if you're more cost effective to engage with you to get to your audience, then, then uh, it is for them to do paid media and that's a really good reason to. Yeah, um, going back to that pitch desk we talked about before, um, putting together something like that and making, presenting an offer to them, you know, I'm willing to do something, I'm willing to do a bespoke piece of video content or a series about this new game that's coming out. Um, it's going to be great, it's going to get this many views, it's going to get this many engagements probably. Um, I will do it for X amount of dollars. That's probably a really good way to do it because you already have that line of communication with them. It's just about you taking it to the next level. Uh, if there is a written agreement between you and a brand and they don't end up paying you a full amount or the amount at all, how do you go about following that up? Uh, good question. Um, so that's happened to you recently? Yeah. Yeah, so that's very unprofessional. That brand is technically illegal if you've got a signed contract, so they can, you can sue them for that. 
Um, if you've got a signed contract and agreement with them where they they have to pay that amount, they have to pay that amount full stop. I can similarly hassle them. Uh, if not, approach someone like us, I'll make a, a, a call or two and we'll get the money for you. Um, so find someone else to represent you and treat that very seriously because it is a business transaction. You know, you're, you're, they're paying you for a service, they have to pay you for that legally. But don't, we'll chase them down for it. What's, what's the way to approach, say you're working with you know, a brand and they send you a product and you've got a product that you're going to do for them and it sucks and you, yeah. So what's, what's the way to approach, like I've had a couple, I do a gaming channel, had a couple of people say, hey, we'll set up reviews you know, for this game. I'm like, look, if I post my review of your game, it's going to hurt your brain more than it's going to help. Like, what's the best way to approach, you know, we, if you say, look, I don't think it's good for us to work together anymore. What's the, what's the best way to approach that? Um, that's a challenging question. Um, I would suggest that um, that point about managing expectations up front is really pertinent to this yeah. point. Um, I think there are polite ways to go about that, where you know you say, uh, thank you so much, but um, I'm not sure if it aligns with my audience, and I'm not sure if my audience will really um, particularly like this product, but I'm um, happy to work in the future on other opportunities. I mean, happy to send it back to you if you want to, but yeah, yeah. I, think, I think just managing that up front as, as early as possible um, <coughs> is the best way to do it, and, and being as polite as you can so that you don't jeopardise that relationship in the future. Definitely rip off the band aid quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't wait till they're like, so you, have you done it yet? <laughs> okay. Um, do you reckon that there are, car people have good and bad managers? Are there any red flags where you can say brand or deal might be a bit dodgy before you get into the day? Uh, there are many. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess if they take a long time to get back to you, if they're wishy-washy on, on signing a contract, for example, so, you know, they're not willing to sign the contract. So, you know, like, oh, look, it's just a single deal, 2500 bucks, like, cool, here's my professional piece of paper that says you're going to pay me this period of time. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Anyway, create the video. There's, there's so many, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, very long list. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, I mean, and like anything, yeah, so you just want to... Yeah, I don't know, ask, ask the right questions as well. If they're willing to answer the right question, you know, and they're going to be getting around the bush a little bit, then maybe it's not something you should trust. And trust your gut as well. And at that point about um, you know, getting something signed on paper, once you've got that, you know, you're, you're protected to an, to an extent. Um, yeah, so as long as you have that, it should be safe. And if they're yeah, reluctant to do that, then maybe back away. Um, say if you wanted to do a collaboration with a instead of so much of a brand, how would you go about like talking to them or confronting them about, hey, I really want to work with you, even if they're like a little bit larger than you or something in that, but you still have quite the same audience type or same interests in your content? Sure. So I was actually chatting with some of the guys last night about that. Um, you want to form a, a, a real friendship with that person, typically. I mean, that's going to work really well. If you have genuine chemistry with that person, then you can be inclined to work with them. If you don't, then it's going to feel very forced and uncomfortable you know, when, when you're on screen and working together. So I guess meet them and connect, have a coffee and say, I love your content. You know, pay them a lot of respect, contribute, say, look, I'm willing to shoot the content for you, look to help them out. You can see that you're going to get value from them. Uh, but basically, I don't know what they want as well, you know, and how you can help them without, you know, going too far, but, you know, support them and, and let them know that you honestly respect what they do and you love to work with them. Maybe, maybe you have a drone and they would love to get some drone footage or, you know, maybe, you know, who knows what it is that you could offer them. Um, yeah, it's not just about the numbers sometimes. Uh, so back when it comes to like, the legality of letting your audience know if you have a brand deal or not, I know you said in Australia you don't have to. Um, I'm from the US, in the US you do. They've changed that recently, whether you say that in the video or you say that in the description. Yeah. So my question is, if you are with the law when it comes to that, is it based on where you are or where the brand that you're dealing with is, or where your audience is. So if I have, I have a portion of my audience is Australian based. So I made a video with an Australian company. Do I need to relay that based on Australian law, or based on US law for the YouTube platform? I'll just call a lawyer and I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's uh, a very good question. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. I mean, it could, it could, uh, I did a bit of research on that. Uh, yep. I found that it's based on where your channel is created. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that, that's excellent. 
So this created another channel in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> We we'll just play it safe anyway. The Australian laws could change in a heartbeat, so it's better than be safe than sorry. Okay, mate. Um, I'm just wondering for people that want to work with a company like Fields, um, is there minimum requirements that you've got to use like a tool like Social Play to have a quick look at who they are so that there is that you know, the ability for you to make money at the same time as helping somebody out? Um, what was that about Social Play? Oh, so Social Play, obviously, you. you you get a great ranking of your yeah. channel, like really simple. So when you when someone contacts you and says, I'd like you to like for us to work together, um, do you have a minimal requirement for you subscribe to that to have them views, um, who they are, what location they are, before you'll say, yeah, we want to work with you? Um, no, there is no minimum requirement. You know, basically, you know, every single uh, project that we work on, you know, we analyze you know, independently. And so we're completely, even though we have a multi-channel network, we're completely agnostic. So we'll even look anywhere in the world to identify the best person that's going to solve this particular problem. So we're, we were the first partners with Tubular Labs uh, in the APAC region. You know, so, we, so it's a really useful tool for us to analyze you know, different data sets to understand you know, how you guys are going to connect together. And that's the basis that we would really determine as to whether or not we'll work with somebody. It could also be relationship based, we know they're professional, we know that they're going to deliver on time, that sort of thing. But the size is actually not relevant at all. Um, some of them believe that size is important. Um, but it's. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed at myself for a little while. Because um, it is. Um, no, no. <laughs> sorry. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Uh, a lot of uh, brands have had uh, like launch events, PR events, stuff like that. Um, so I'm wondering, like, how how do you discover those events prior so that you can pitch to their PR people to get invited to those? Sure, you could use the internet to be one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a really good way to find out. I approach them directly, you know, and, and, and source that. I mean, I guess it, it comes down to literally just search and identify. And there's different websites that can aggregate those things and identify what events are, you know, relevant. Um, yeah, um, it's tricky because obviously sometimes they wouldn't make them public. Uh, like there's one called Social Diary. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, no, it's run by a PR person. Yeah. There you go. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, otherwise, I guess if you know brands that do put, like, if you've seen past events put on by a brand and want to work with, I guess you can reach out to them, you know, say, for future, I'd like to get involved. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>